Man, am I tired. Wish I could have slept in today. Why do I have to be here anyway? I give online and I can watch the service at home. The music sure was lame. I didn't get into any of those songs. <laughs> Looks like Jim worked late last night. Then again, he dozes off every Sunday. Speaking of sleepy, I hope the message isn't as boring as last week, and I hope it's short. I'm really hungry. Oh, another 40 minutes. Will this service ever end? Why am I here anyway? Oh, man, I just remembered I'm here this morning because I'm supposed to preach. What about you? Why are you here? Ever been in a boring business meeting or meeting at work and thought, why am I here? I can't wait to get out of this place. Or maybe you've gotten trapped in a conversation or some kind of gathering and all you could think about was how you could uh, get away or make your exit. Ever felt those emotions in church? You ever thought some of the things that you heard me thinking? We're going to ask two questions this morning, and the first very simply is, why are you here? I think it's good for each of us to ask ourselves, why am I here? In 1903, Emperor Nicholas II was the Tsar of Russia, and he was looking out uh, the window across the Kremlin grounds one day, and he saw a sentry posted out on the grounds, but the sentry wasn't posted at a gate, wasn't posted at an entrance, wasn't posted near a building. He was just out in the middle of the grounds. And Nicholas thought, well, why, why is he there? And he began to ask others, why is he there? And his subordinates began to research, and they discovered that in 1776, Catherine the Great, who was a czar at that time, was walking the grounds of the Kremlin. It was early spring, and the first flower had appeared out there in the middle of the Kremlin grounds. And so she posted a sentry there to make sure that that flower did not get trampled. And 127 years later, there was still a sentry posted on that spot with no idea of why he was there. Do you know why you're here? Maybe you're here because your family has always gone to church, and so it's part of your heritage or part of your tradition. Maybe you're here because in the South, it's pretty acceptable to go to church. Maybe you're here because it makes you feel better. Maybe you're here because you have a sense of duty or obligation. Maybe you're here because you think uh, coming to church on a somewhat regular basis makes you more acceptable to God. I think every week that we gather, there are probably some who are here who really don't know why they're here. They just have felt drawn, and there's some sense of need, sense of need um, that they're trying to have fulfilled. Now, I'm sure for all of us, if we're real honest, at, at different times in our lives, we've come for one of those reasons. But if I was to go out in the crowd and personally ask you, why are you here? All of you would probably answer, I'm here to worship God. And that, that's certainly true. That's why we gather. That's why it's called a worship service. And, you know, we could spend hours going through the scriptures that tell us the importance of worship. In fact, this week I was reading through the Psalms, and in just five Psalms, from Psalm 95 to Psalm 100, there are multiple commands to worship. Psalm 95, come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Psalm 96, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among the peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Psalm 98, sing to the Lord a new song. He has done marvelous things. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with a harp, with a harp and the sound of singing. Psalm 99, the Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. Let them praise your great and awesome name. You are holy. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. He is holy. Exalt the Lord our God, worship at his holy mountain, for he, the Lord, is holy. Psalm 100, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth, worship the Lord with gladness, come before him with joyful songs, know that the Lord he is God. I think we can all agree 
that we are supposed to, we are, we are called on, we are compelled, we are commanded in Scripture to be involved in worshiping the Lord. The question is, why here? You know, you've heard, as I have, many people say, I, I can worship the Lord on my own individually on the golf course or on the lake or out in the woods hunting. Yes, you can and, and you should. Others would say, well, I watch uh, a worship service on television or on the internet, or I listen to preachers on the radio. Is that adequate? Is that what God has called us to? Sadly, there are some, and you probably know some of these, who don't gather for worship at, at a church, at any church, because at some point in their past, they were once very involved and very active, but they were hurt in some way. Someone offended them, or something happened at the church that, that uh, made them unhappy. And if that's you today, you're, you're probably not here, you're probably online, if that's you today, I want to say to you that God has not given you a pass on gathering with the body. As Christians, we're called to biblically work through offenses and, and to reconnect where there has been brokenness and separation. That's what we're called to do. All of those excuses are just that. They are excuses. They do not hold up to biblical instruction and biblical admonition. We're going to look at several passages today, but let me give you the, the foundational passage, the key passage that this message is based on. It's in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to, what are those next two words? Say them out loud. Meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What is the day drawing near? It's Jesus' return. Clearly, we're called not to worship individually, although we may do that during the week and we should do that during the week, but we're called on a regular basis to meet together. Sometimes we don't realize how much we need uh, the body of Christ, how much we need to be together as the church. God never intended us to live out our faith on our own. He knew we needed regular interaction with, with the community of believers, with the church. So I'm going to start this morning by mentioning just three benefits of being connected. Not just attending not just showing up occasionally, but three benefits of being connected to the church. And, and this is where our connection starts. We have small groups, we have other Bible studies, but it starts with the body coming together. Three benefits. Benefit number one is safety. Do you know that only point zero zero one one thousandth of one percent of deaths occur in the church? You're safer here than at home, than in your car, than anywhere else. Actually, I'm referring to safety in the spiritual sense. Peter, writing to the believers in 1 Peter 5.8, gave them this instruction, this admonition, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, You've seen all those same nature shows I've seen, and you know that, that in nature, predators in the wild do what? They isolate the young or they isolate the weak from the, from the pack or from the herd in order to devour them. That's exactly what Satan does. That's what Peter is warning us about here. Now, you think about it. If you were outside somewhere and a, and a wild animal or predator showed up, would you rather be alone or in a crowd? I'd much rather be in a crowd. I only have to be faster than the slowest person in that crowd. Is it easy, he says that we're to be watchful, is it easy to be watchful on your own or to have someone else watching your back? You can't live the Christian life the way God intended. You can't live the Christian life in, in isolation. If you try to live the Christian life in isolation, you're an easy target. So part of the reason we come together is for safety. Second benefit is for strength in the storms of life. Just last week, we looked at this incredible storm the disciples were in, and we acknowledged that all believers at some time or other are going to go through storms, some more storms, some more intense storms, but we're all going to go through storms. I thought of the words of Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, two are better than one. 
Because they have good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who's alone when he falls and has no one, not another, to lift him up. I'm, I'm pretty sure the disciples were grateful when they were in that storm that they were all together. They weren't toiling or, or fighting the storm on their own, but they were together in that storm. If you've ever been to, uh, to Northern California, you perhaps have seen the giant forests of, of sequoias. Do you know that sequoias can grow up to 311 feet tall? That's, that's more than a football field. The best known sequoia is the General Sherman. General Sherman is 275 feet tall, 36 feet in diameter. That means the circumference, the distance around the General, Sh General Sherman is 113 feet. Massive, massive tree. And there are many trees that size. But the amazing thing about sequoias is they grow so fast that their root system is not adequate. Their root system is very shallow. And yet they're able to withstand high winds. They're able to withstand storms. And the reason is all those sequoias, those shallow roots, they all intertwine with the trees around them. And so there's strength for the storm because they're in it together. Third benefit of us being together is just the fact that we can share the daily load. Paul in Galatians 6.2 said we're to bear one another's burdens. Again, God didn't intend for you to go through the Christian life alone, but to have others around you to encourage you and support you and help you and to bear burdens. Philippians 3.14, Paul said, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's easier to press on toward the goal if you're not running alone. It's easier to press on toward the goal if others are running with you and alongside you and encouraging you. The most dramatic picture I've ever had of, of that was in our last, I think it's been two or three years ago, we used to do a 5K race here called Run With The Sun. It's a horrible race. You start out down in what we call the pit, and right out of the gate you have to run up the hill. Then you run down to Pulaski Tech and make a loop and you come back. And I don't know if you've ever noticed when you're leaving, if you're going towards Saline County, but right outside this last parking lot entrance exit is this big drop. You gotta come back up that thing and, and you're, you're done. And the last race that I ran, I'm about three steps up the hill and all I can think about is I'm stopping. I'm not walking, I'm stopping. Kent Sanders, Kent's probably up in the venue this morning, Kent Sanders pulled up alongside me and began to encourage me. Come on, man, you got this. Just get up this hill. Come on, man, it's just one short loop. Around. And he encouraged me all the way to the end of that race. That's what it looks like to run toward the prize with others. Well, what are we talking about here? It's a word we use all the time. It's the word fellowship. Now, it might shock you, but food is not in the definition of fellowship. It's companionship. It's, it's people have a community of interest. What it is for us is recognizing as believers, we're in this together. As so we come together as the body of Christ, we, we benefit from the gifts of others. We function better within the body. We glean wisdom from people around us on how to get through and, and how to do life. Now, as I said a few moments ago, yes, there are other ways to connect with the body, but our primary means is coming together for worship. We, we, God made us. We were made for connection. We were made for worship. And you don't get the, the richness or the full benefit of worship alone at the lake or in the woods or on the golf course. You don't get it from watching, from watching on the internet at home. Now, let me pause right here. I need to speak to you guys that are watching uh, online. I'm not speaking to those of you who are at home and online because of safety or health reasons. I'm not talking to you, so put your phone down, stop sending the text or email you're about to send me, okay? I'm not talking to you. Well, let's be honest, there are a lot of people who are still at home, still watching on the internet simply because it's convenient, because it doesn't take much effort, because you don't have to get up and get ready, maybe because you don't want to be around people, whatever. If you're a believer, that's not appropriate worship. Listen, worshiping at home or, or watching on TV or the internet is like standing over the kitchen sink eating a TV dinner when you could be sitting down to a steak dinner with all the trimmings with your entire family around the table. Why would you eat a TV dinner? I'm not talking to those of you who are home for safety or health. <laughs> Please do not message me. We're made for connection. 
We're made for worship. You know, God created us with what the French philosopher Pascal called a God-shaped void. Nothing else can fill that. And even people who don't know the Lord have this emptiness in them because they're made to know God and to worship him. And, and sometimes that desire for worship can lead to some pretty strange outcomes. Back post 9-11 when people were so tuned in to, to the church and looking for God and all that was going on, the Chicago Tribune ran a story of a, little, a woman in a little village in northern Mexico who was making a, a meal for her family and in one of the tortillas she felt like, in the burn marks on the tortilla, she felt like she saw the face of Jesus. She showed it to her husband, he agreed, she showed it to her neighbor, he agreed. They took that tortilla to the priest and had it blessed, and then right outside their home, they built this little shrine that they put this tortilla in. Oh, it gets crazier. Over the next three or four months, 8,000 people came to that little village to visit the shrine of the tortilla that had the face of Jesus on it. And every one of those 8,000 agreed, except for one reporter who said, it looks like former heavyweight boxing champ Leon Spinks. You know, it's funny and that's crazy, but sometimes we may not be any more accurate in our worship. Two questions this morning. The first one we've kind of talked about, why am I here? What are, what are the benefits of coming together? Let's talk about what we're doing. What are we doing when we come together? What is worship? Here's a, here's a good dictionary definition. If you looked up worship in the dictionary, this is the first definition that pops up. Worship is extravagant respect or admiration for or devotion to an object of esteem. Now, let me tell you, we're not devoted to an object of esteem. We're devoted, we're worshiping a loving creator God. So let me give you a better definition of how we would say worship is defined. Worship is our response to God for who he is and what he has done. Listen, expressed in our thoughts, our attitudes, our words, and our actions. Let that sink in for just a moment. We, we probably get that we worship with our words and with our actions, but even our thoughts and attitudes are a part of our worship. I wonder how many of us this morning when, when we got up had the same attitude that David did when he said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. It's probably more like, man, I wish I could sleep in but I have to go to church today. It's, it's that duty thing. It's thinking that it makes us more acceptable to the Lord when we come to his house and come to worship. What about your thoughts? When you come in here, when you gather for worship, when we begin, how, how are you preparing yourself before we begin? I don't know, but when we begin, where are your thoughts when you're worshiping? Are, are you just singing the words that are on the screen? Or do you recognize that those songs that we're singing are, are, are not for us to hear each other? We are communicating to the Lord. We are offering up prayers. We are making commitments to the Lord as we're singing those songs. So you, you show up, you sit in this room, you hear and maybe join in and sing some songs. You, you try to stay focused as scripture is taught. That doesn't necessarily mean that, that you've worshipped. In fact, if you've been around church for any length of time, it's pretty easy because you know the lingo and you know what's supposed to happen. It's pretty easy to just kind of put it on autopilot and go through the motions. If we're not careful, what happens here on a Sunday morning is not a worship service. It's a spiritual show. It's a thumbs up or a thumbs down. We judge it based on our preferences. We, we think the music was lame and so we don't participate. We're not here for us. We're not here for what we want. We're not here for what we're going to get out of the service. The object of our worship is Jesus. The object of our worship is Jesus. When we really give mindful thought to what he has done, as Pastor Curtis explained before we prayed and began our service this morning, we give mindful thought to what he has done, the worship will flow freely. When we recognize that we weren't worthy of his love, we weren't worthy of the sacrifice he made, and when we focus on that, the fact that he died for us while we were yet sinners, worship will come very naturally. 
I share this passage with you frequently because it's one of my favorites out of Philippians 2, but I want you to hear again Paul's words about what Christ has done. Although he was by very nature God, he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to. But he emptied himself. He made himself nothing. He took the very nature of a servant and was made in human likeness as a man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now listen to the worship aspect. Therefore, because he did these things, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth. Yes, even those who don't confess him as Lord one day are going to bow. It won't make any difference in their eternal outcome, but every knee will bow and every knee, every tongue will confess or acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's your rationale for worship. Think about what Jesus did and that he left heaven and came to earth. He left a perfect place and came to a place that was far from perfect. He put himself in a limited human body and suffered all the things that we suffer, was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. He was a servant. Jesus didn't know. it. If, if you watch the series The Chosen, it's pretty accurate. He didn't know where he would sleep at night. They didn't know where they would lay their heads. Jesus and the disciples were doing ministry. They didn't know what they would have to eat. He became a servant. And then... His life was not taken from him. He gave his life up on the cross, the worst, most excruciating form of death. You know the word crucifixion comes from the word excruciating? The most excruciating form of death known to man. Therefore, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And God help us when we come in this place and we're not tuned in and we're not paying attention and we're not worshiping the object of our worship, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we awaken our spirit to this truth, ought to becomes want to. When we, when we understand that he's the object of our worship, participating in worship becomes a celebration, not an obligation. Let me give you three simple keys that will help enhance your worship. Number one, you need to show up. You need to show up. You have to be present physically. I'm not saying you can't worship on your own. I hope you're doing that during the week every day, but we are called to come together as the body of Christ. You know, sometimes I sit and I wonder, what would happen pre-COVID? Our crowd sizes are smaller now because people are still not getting out and around folks. Pre-COVID, what would happen if the every other weekers or the once in a whiles all showed up on the same Sunday? We'd have to have multiple worship services in this room. We couldn't contain them all. And these people all say that they're believers, and yet they don't avail themselves of corporate worship. And, and you see it all through Scripture. In Mark 1.21, it says, When the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the synagogue. Did Jesus need to go worship? No. But he's setting the example. Luke 4.16 and he, Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, as was his custom. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. Acts 13, 14, but they, who were they? Paul and Barnabas and their traveling companions. They went from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. It's clear from Scripture. We saw that in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. We're to come together for worship. We call it the Lord's Day. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It's the Lord's Day. It's set aside for him. It's set apart for him. How do we keep it holy? We, on the Lord's Day, we come into the Lord's house. You have to be here. And you have to, to commit yourself. You have to decide in advance that you're going to honor the Lord by being here. Don't decide on Sunday morning. Satan will help you make that decision. I was always taught growing up that we prepared for worship on Saturday night. 
Even when I was in high school, my mother would stop by my room and check and make sure I had my clothes for Sunday laid out. And this is ridiculous. I don't do it anymore much. My shoes had to be shined. Every Saturday, my shoes had to be shined before we went to worship on Sunday morning. But the principle was that we prepared on Saturday night. What does that mean to me and you? It's probably not staying up late. It's probably thinking ahead, especially we have kids, of how things are going to go. And you know it's going to go awry, so you have to prepare for that. But it's making the commitment. And you really shouldn't have to make this commitment every week. It should be a one-time commitment. We are going to gather with the body for worship. And let me give you a little hint. When temptation is the strongest to skip worship, it could be that God has something incredible in store for you on that Sunday. You know where that temptation is coming from. Even one doesn't want you gathered with the body, doesn't want you participating in worship. When that temptation is strong, it may be that God has something great in store for you. you got to show up. Secondly, you have to come expecting. You need to come here expecting to have an encounter or an experience with God. John and I were talking just this week, you know, as leaders, we have to be careful. We don't get so programmed in our worship service that we don't have time or space for God to break in and interrupt. You know, sometimes our prayer is, God, would you please do something not in the order of worship today? But, but that should be true for all of us, that, that we come asking God to meet us here. Now, God showing up is, is a sovereign act we, we can't make him do that. He shows up where he chooses to show up. But I will tell you, he's certainly not going to come if his people aren't ready for him to come and aren't longing for him to come. So we should show up with a sense of expectation, with a desire or, or a longing for an encounter with God. Much like the words of David in Psalm 42, as a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? That should be our expectation, that we have this desire, this thirst for God. And as we think about expectations, let me remind you that corporate worship is affected. What, what happens here corporately is affected by individual worshipers. And so just a word of caution to think about here. Make sure you've prepared your heart for worship. Paul warned the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the spirit. Unconfessed sin quenches the spirit, and if the spirit is quenched, that certainly prevents the presence of God. So make sure that you come expecting and prepared for worship. And then finally, number three, and this is probably most important for those of you who are here in the room, as well as those online, when you show up for worship, it's more than just being present physically. It's being present mentally and emotionally. You have to engage in worship. You can't just come and sit and wait for something to hit you, wait for something to happen. You're supposed to be engaged in worship. Worship is not the performance of a few in, in order for the masses to be able to worship. You're supposed to be involved. You know, in a lot of churches, and, and here as well, we approach worship this way. We look at those that are on the platform as the actors, and we think of those in the congregation as the audience. That's completely wrong. There's only one audience, one person in the audience. It's God. He's the audience. The leaders, those who are up here, are just prompters, and the congregation are the actors, for an audience of one. And when that becomes clear to us, then it's very obvious, or it should be very obvious, that our worship is not about our preferences. We're here to offer our heart and soul up before the Lord. Isaiah 29, 13. Isaiah records against the children of Israel this offense before the Lord. God says, these people come near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips, but their what? What's the next word? Heart. Their hearts are far from me. Look at this last line. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. 
God doesn't care about all of our rules and all of our function and all of our order. And if we're just worshiping with our lips, if we're just going through the motions, but not with our heart, that's not pleasing to him. We haven't worshiped. Four simple applications for you this morning. Pray on the lot. When you pull in here on Sunday morning, I know this has happened to you. It happened to us. Most of the time our kids were growing up, we never had any kind of mishap or argument on Sunday morning. Because we were in two cars. Luann had the kids. I was here early. I know what happens, though, okay? Listen, whatever happens at the house, you're coming down the road, you're still fussing at the kids and maybe swatting one over the seat, whatever, and then you pull onto the parking lot and it's like the old fantasy island. Smiles everyone, right? Listen, when you pull on the parking lot, regardless of what's happened on the way here, when you pull up and you put it in park, hey, Dad, before everybody jumps out of the car and runs their separate ways, you ought to stop and pray. God, we're expecting to meet you today. We're expecting to have an encounter with you today. Would you speak to us? Before you even get out of your car, you should express that to the Lord. And then as you're coming in, I don't call this an auditorium. I either call this a sanctuary or a worship center. There's a big difference. As you're coming into this worship center, you need to put off your shoes. Now, not literally. We've done that before, I know. But when I say put off your shoes, I'm, I'm referring you back to when Moses approached that burning bush and the Lord's presence was there, the voice spoke to him and said, take off your shoes for the place you're standing is holy ground. What does it mean to take off your shoes? Well, think about your shoes. Your shoes go everywhere in this world. They pick up all kind of dirt and all kind of nastiness. What I mean by put off your shoes as you're coming into this room, and maybe it's when you first get in this room that you just pause and put off your shoes. I mean to clear your heart and clear your mind of all the stuff of the world. Stop thinking about that business deal. Stop thinking about whether or not the roast is going to burn before you get home. I'm not going to be that long, okay? Put all that stuff away. Clear it up. Third, expect to encounter the living Lord. Got to keep coming back to that. What do you expect to happen when you show up here? And then finally, remember the worship service is not about you. It's not about what you're going to receive. It's about what you're giving to the Lord. When you come here for worship, instead of thinking about what you're going to get out of the worship service, think about what you're going to give. You're here to give to the Lord. That's what worship's about.